let's move on. And I promise that I'm going to give you LSTMs. Not only I'm going to give you LSTMs, but we are going to discuss a paper that goes beyond LSTMs, at least when it comes to classification. There are three different types of trying to represent sentences and phrases. We learned the bag of words models, which is basically you have a bunch of word vectors, add them up. There are a bunch of words in your sentence, create the corresponding vectors, add them up. And a lot of classes of models are going to fall into that category. But there is a catch here. There is a downside to it. You're going to lose the ordering of your words. For instance, cats climb trees is going to give you the same representation versus trees climb cats. One of them has a meaning. The other one doesn't have any meaning. We learned about sequence models and CNNs are actually, you can think of them as, CN, as sequence models. We also learned about tree structured models like recursive neural networks. So CNNs, RNNs are sequence models. We are going to learn another sequence model later on, which is about attention. And then you're going to have some tree structure models. What is a recurrent neural network? You have a sequence, a sequence goes in, a sequence comes out, a sequence of vectors goes in, a sequence of vectors comes out. Or you can say a matrix goes in, a matrix comes out of a recurrent neural network. The recurrent neural network is going to carry some hidden state, which is this arrow here, and you're passing from one time step to the next time step. You're going to have two inputs to each unit. So each one of these you're going to call a recurrent unit. One is the current word that you're looking at or the current character that you're looking at. Here we are going to look at words. So this is the current word that we're looking at, which is a vector. You're going to multiply it by a matrix to change the dimension so that we can add it to the rest of the entries here. There is another input, which is the history, and it's going to summarize whatever information that we had before this step. You multiply it by a matrix, and then you add the bias. And then you push it through a nonlinearity that's going to give you whatever that's coming out of your recurrent neural network for the next step. And initially, there is no input, so you're going to set this to zero. There is a catch. You can actually write this model. It's a great model. But when you sit behind your computer, things are not going to converge. These weights and biases are not going to converge. Your loss is not going to converge. And there is a problem with them. The problem is vanishing or exploding gradients. Why is that? You see H here. In the next time step, H is going to go here. It's going to get multiplied by a matrix. You go to the next time step. Then the H is going to come here. You are multiplying by the same matrix. In the end, what's happening is you have U to the power of your sequence length getting multiplied by your initial H. So you have a lot of matrices getting multiplied together. And what is the problem with that? Whenever you multiply a lot of numbers together, two things would happen. They are all perhaps less than one. And then these values are going to go to zero. After a while that you multiply it together, you're not going to see your H anymore, or it's going to explode, or U is bigger than one, and then it's going to explode. And in fact, you can actually look at the eigenvalues of these matrices and do this analysis. So whenever you are multiplying a lot of things together, there is the catch that things might explode or vanish. So is this point clear? Any questions about it? Okay, perfect. And that's why people introduced LSTMs. The idea of LSTM is that you are going to have a memory cell. So you're going to have a cell that's going to go across your uh, recurrent neural network. And this cell, sometimes you're going to forget its information. Sometimes you're going to add information to it. And sometimes you're going to output some information from it. But whatever it's that you're doing, you always, this, you always have this constant throughout your architecture. And the gradients are going to flow through C. So you can think of it as a shortcut connection for LSTMs. We learned about ResNets. We can think of it as a shortcut connection across your layers. And by the way, recurrent neural networks, LSTMs, are as deep as your sequence length. That's actually their depth. You can also stack them on top of each other, and that's going to give you another level of depth. But RNNs are as deep as the sequence length which could end up being really deep. So you have this constant throughout your architecture. Sometimes you're going to input information to it, and that's going to be called input gate. 
Sometimes you're going to forget something out of C. Sometimes you're going to output information. And this is going to carry your memory with you. And if you look at it, this UT is exactly this formula that you have up there with different matrices, but it's, a, but it's exactly that formula. And that's going to give you the new information that you have. Sometimes you input that new information. Sometimes you forget. And the forget gate is also adaptive. If a new sentence goes in, the amount of it that you're going to forget is going to depend on your input. So these are not constant. These are functions of your sentences. A different sentence goes in, and then you're going to have a different sequence of forget gates, another sequence of input gates, another sequence of output gates. And some of these are really crucial. Towards the end of the semester, we are going to do a systematic study on the architecture of LSTMs. And some of these are actually crucial. For instance, this output gate is crucial. This tan h gate or this tan h function is crucial or this nonlinearity, we cannot get rid of it. You do a systematic study on them and then you reach to the conclusion that empirically speaking, tan h is important. Another thing that's really important is this forget gate. We can get rid of the input gate by, but by setting ft to be one minus it and get rid of this quantity, but this forget gate is really important. You need to forget some information. And then this is gonna give you your hidden state. You go to the next step. That's your LSTM architecture. I think it's better to look at LSTM architecture using the formulas behind it rather than those figures, because now you understand everything and in exact terms, what is the architecture. You can have multiple, multiple layers of LSTMs stacked on top of each other. A sequence goes in, another sequence is gonna come out. Then you take that sequence, push it, push it as input to another layer of LSTM, and then you keep repeating that. And then you can go backward in time as well. This is going forward. Your sequence can go backward as well. And that's gonna give you bidirectional. Any questions about LSTMs? Because now I'm gonna generalize it. Okay, perfect. For sentences, you can actually parse them and then create a tree out of them. We saw it when we were actually looking at uh, SSD data, Stanford Sentiment Tree Bank data. There is actually a tree structure for sentences. And this is nice. This is also a tree. If you look at a recon or on network, you're going to see a tree. X1 goes in, H1 is going to come out. Here is the same thing. You have X4 going in, the corresponding label coming out. There is going to be an H. This could be your hidden. There is going to be another H, H5, H6. There is going to be H3 here and H2 here. And it's as if you're skipping time or time steps, depending on the, on the grammatical structure of your sentence. So this is a generalization of RNNs or LSTMs. You can have two different types of tree structures. Some of them are nary. For instance, you pick an N, maybe you say, I want my graph to only have two children all the time or two nodes all the time. And then uh, your children are ordered, the first child, the second child, or you can have a child sum. Here you can have higher branching factor. Branching factor in the previous case was two. In this case could be three or more. And then your children don't have to be ordered. You don't favor one over another. Let's start with the child sum tree LSDM. Given any node in your tree, you can look at the set of children and then you can generalize an LSTM. How would you do it? First of all, when you see T here, time, the corresponding object, when it comes to trees, we can call it J, and this is the Jth node in your tree. So in this formula, whenever you see J, you can think of it as T, as your time. Each J is gonna have a set of children. Each child is gonna have a hidden state, like what you have here, there is a hidden state. There is a hidden state here, here, and here. You're gonna have input gate. You're gonna have more than one for that gate. So you're gonna forget a portion of this child. You're gonna forget another portion of another child and so on. There is gonna be output gate, which is similar to what you have here. There is gonna be information at the current node. Some of that information you're gonna input. Some of the information from the children you're gonna forget. 
And then this is just a child sum because the order of your children doesn't really matter. This way you are adding all of them up together. You can have an array type of a structure. In that case, the order of your children matters. And for each one of your children, you are going to multiply them by their corresponding matrix and then add them up. So now each child having a different matrix is going to be treated differently. But the rest of it is the same. You have multiple forget gates, a single input gate, a single output gate. There is going to be the 10H. And there is your uh, hidden state or memory cell. For each node, you're going to have a memory cell. And then you can do a classification. How would you do it? A sentence goes in. In the last layer, you're going to end up with a hidden state. Or at any of these nodes, you actually have a hidden state. You can correct its size. Maybe you have only five classes in the end. You correct the size. You turn them into probabilities. And then you can do your training the usual way. You maximize the likelihood of the correct labels. And then when it comes to testing, you can just pick the maximum entry at each node, and that's going to give you the corresponding label. There is another task that I want to cover. So far, everything that we covered was about classification. A sentence goes in and you want to classify it. What if you have two, sen two sentences or a pair of sentences, and your task is how similar are these two sentences together in some sense. And the sense could be how related are they semantically speaking. And then you have a score between one up until capital K and K is an integer. You can say that these two sentences are really close to each other or these are not close at all. You have your sentence left. It's going to have its own representation. You have a sentence right. It's going to have its own representation. These are two vectors. You can multiply them pointwise. Or you can subtract them and look at the abstract. These are two features in the end that you can multiply by their corresponding matrices. That's going to give you HS, which is going to give you a probability in the end after a softmax. This is what is going to come out of your model. This function is going to give you a score that is going to go from 1 up until k in a smooth way. Because this p, you can evaluate it wherever you want. So it's going to smoothly interpolate from 1 up until k. How are we going to actually train this? You know the corresponding y's in that data set. You know that these two sentences are semantically very related. Maybe the corresponding number is k. From the scale of 1 up until 10, they are 10 similar to each other. That's your y. You know the corresponding r. What you don't know is the ground truth probability. And if you look at the paper, it's a bunch of Dirac delta functions. That's going to give you your p. Now that you have the ground truth p, you know the p coming out of your model, you can write down the KL divergence between the two. So KL divergence is going to give you the distance between two distributions. Now that you have a distance, you can minimize that. And that's going to give you the corresponding score and actually your last function to train. I think I'm going to stop here and answer questions. And for those of you who want to leave, you can leave. So there is a question in the chat. So are the Y values predicted word classes for each position in a sentence or sentiment classes generally? This doesn't have to be sentiment. This could be any classification task. The one that we are really interested in is this last guy which is going to give you the class corresponding to the input sentence. But each one of these words or combination of words could have separate classes. And we saw an example of this when we were doing uh, sentiment tree bank. For instance, each one of these words could have a neutral sense, a positive sense, a negative sense. The combination of them could end up being negative. So those Ys are these classes at each node. And the last one is actually what we are interested in. Uh, sure. Any other questions? So this task is really important, the closeness. It's actually what you can do when you're searching for something on the internet. This doesn't have to be semantic relatedness.